Hey everybody, I'm Nate Savage, and welcome to this episode of the Fretboard Chronicles, presented by Guitario. And if you don't know who the gentleman sitting next to me is, you should. His name is Don Ross, and he's from the east coast of Canada. Amazing gift to the guitar community in general, and you know, one of the best fingerstyle guitar players you're ever going to see. And um, he's got a long list of accomplishments, and we're really honored to have him here today. He, you have loads of albums out that you guys need to check out. Um, lots and lots. And only fingerstyle guitar, so only guitarist to ever win the fingerstyle national guitar championship in the U.S. Not once, but twice. That's amazing. And there you have it. And he's toured with so many just unbelievably reputable guitar players like Andy McKee and two of my personal favorite guitar players of all time, Beppe Gambetta and Dan Crary. Mm -hmm. And if you want to find out more about him, you can either go to what's facebook.com slash Don Ross Music. I think that's right. Or DonRossOnline.com. And buy, just go buy every CD he has. It's fine. That's the best idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. What we're going to be talking about today, thanks for coming up, by the way, Don. Oh, pleasure. Yeah, great to be here. Appreciate it. Um, we've been filming videos all day on alternate tunings, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Don's going to kind of get into that world and show you, if you're interested in experimenting with that, we're going to take, um, basically break it down into three sections for you. A problem, a solution, and then musical enlightenment. How you can apply it to music, right? And Don's going to take us through that every step of the way. So, like... You use so many different alternate tunings in your playing. What's the problem, as you see, that some players run into when they're starting to pursue um, finger style or composition that this can solve for them? Right. Well, <clears throat> I started playing guitar when I was really young. And the, it's great to start young because, uh, you know, you grow your skill set pretty quickly. The only problem is that uh, relatively early on, I was starting to think like, well, what else can you do on this thing? And I, <laughs> so I, I, um, I could play all the chords and I could play along with songs and my ear was good. But then I, um, I realized that sometimes I, I, I really wanted to try to capture all the parts of a tune. Like, like I would be listening to a Sly and the Family Stone song or whatever and, and want to play the bass line and the mm -hmm. melody line and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, I found that with certain tunes, it just was almost impossible. You'd be doing these, you know, crazy things with your hands, trying to trying to get all the notes in there. And then when I started writing tunes, um, I found that often I was getting caught up with this problem where I I had an idea for you know a melody and, and a, an idea for accompanying harmony, but then I, I couldn't accomplish it on uh, in standard tuning. So then uh, I, I came to realize that there was you know, no law against changing your tuning. Uh, but it, it was just something I, I morphed into pretty uh, innocently. Back then, there was no internet or anything like that. I was, I was living uh, in a very francophone part of Canada um, without a lot of access to a lot of stuff that I guess people would have taken for granted in more English-speaking parts of North America. Um, so I didn't know about people like Joni Mitchell ch changing her tuning or mm -hmm or um, uh, Stephen Stills changing his tuning. I just started doing it a little bit uh, because it made certain things much easier to play. Not everything, obviously, because the, the tunings were kind of tailor-made yeah. for whatever, but very often it was just one string, you know? That was kind of what I, would, what I started out doing with the altered tunings. Cool, yeah. well, that, that's kind of the same. Usually, I don't use alternate tunings very much, but when I do is to facilitate something that I'm hearing in my head that I, I just can't do it. That's exactly that's right? exactly why I do it. At least that's where it started. Well, for me, I think eventually I, I came to realize that you can actually create a whole different other sort of tone palette, you know, on the instrument by tuning, especially lower or higher than normal. Higher is dangerous, but I mean, <laughs> normally I tune below pitch, and uh, so as a result, I get these guitars made with longer necks and sometimes the fan frets, depending on the instrument. Sure in order to accommodate the lower tunings and create more string tension so that you'll still get a really strong fundamental on the notes and then the strings won't flop around and right. stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's <clears throat> like the issue we're taking a look at here or the problem, I guess you call it, is like, hey, I have this idea in my head or I want to play a certain range, but that it's just, I can't. Standard tuning won't afford that to me. And the solution is, I guess, alternate tunings depend on, depending on what you're, you know, you're shooting for as to which one you're using. but. You have an example for us today, and you did a whole series on this earlier that you're going to show us. It's a really, it's a really cool take on an alternate tuning or an open tuning that um, is pretty common. Mm -hmm. But you want to show us and get started with that? Just sure. Show us, yeah. Well, um, yeah. There's there's the whole idea of altering your tuning. That's a more general idea, and then more specifically, there are what are called open tunings, and that that's essentially where you tune your strings of your guitar 
to a specific chord voicing, so it could be a major chord or a minor chord, something very identifiable. And when I was about 14 years old, I learned this Bruce Coburn tune off one of his records, and I realized after really listening to it really hard, listening for the open strings and stuff like that, um, that I could hear it. he was actually tuned to a C chord, which I had never encountered before. You know, I thought, well, who would ever tune that low? But it sounded amazing. So the tuning that Bruce used, um, he, he raises his second string up to a C, then the first and third strings can stay where they are because that forms a little C chord there on the top three strings. Then the fourth string goes down to a C, because you're trying to tune to the three notes in the C major triad. And then the A string goes down to a G. And then the bottom string, this is the, this is the big <laughs> thing. The bottom string goes all the way down to a C, which is a major third lower right. than, than normal. So, And then it always necessitates a certain amount of fine tuning afterwards. But there, now you, now you have a, an open chord uh, tuning based on a C major. So the notes, again, from low to higher, C, G, C, G, C, E. And so Bruce's tune uh, used this tuning, and I, I learned it off the album. Then uh, a number of years later, I think I was about 22 years old, I had this idea where I wanted to write a tune as a bit of a dedication to Bruce and to learning, having learned that song. It was a real turning point for me because I think learning that piece was kind of the, the moment mm -hmm. where I really knew that I, that was the kind of guitar I really wanted to play and uh, found it really, really fascinating that you could do that all on your own and so much music had come out. So uh, I started writing this piece in the same tuning, but then a lot of the fingerings I was trying to get, along with the melodies, were impossible to get, even in this tuning. And I really wanted to get what was in my head. You know, very often the, the ideas would come as I was walking down the street. So um, I just, to make a long story short, what I ended up doing was um, getting rid of this nice low C, sadly, but, but tuning it all the way up to an F. And it wasn't for any random reason. I really wanted to have an open F on a string somewhere because I wanted to hit that as a bass note sometimes. And then, same thing, I wanted to get an A as an open bass note sometimes. So I, I tuned the fifth string back, back up to an A. Yeah, watch <laughs> out. You put your contact in, that was probably yeah, a mistake. No, you should have your, glasses, your glasses on. on. <laughs> There you go. This is the tuning I came up with. So the top four strings are still the same as an open C. So C, G, C, E on the top four strings. Then on the bottom now we have an F. The cool thing is, instead of by accident, on the bottom three strings I have an F major chord, F, A, C. And, the, and then I realized, uh, part of the, the compositional process, I realized that <laughs> in the top five strings now I have an A minor chord, but it's actually, it's an A minor seventh, so very beautiful chord. And then if you play all six strings together, that's actually called an F major ninth. So it's kind of like four tunings in one. And uh, you know, like my old joke is that at the age of 22, I thought I was gonna be up for the Nobel tuning prize, uh, then found out there wasn't such a thing. But, um, <laughs> But that's, that's the tuning I came up with, and all the compositional ideas were achievable in this tuning. Really that's cool. pretty cool, because you have, what, that's the one chord, the four, and the six. Exactly. Just pretty, depending on what string you hit. Yeah, and really nice uh, voicings of those chords and chord extensions of right. them, too. It's pretty cool. Cool. Now, now was it the, uh, the standard open C or this, or this tuning that you came up with where you showed all the diatonic chords in the key of uh, C? Oh, that was in a straight up uh, open okay, cool. C. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, um... But I can get back into it. Yeah, I, I actually would like to do this just because this might be a nice gateway for some people who have never messed with open tunings to um, start messing around with them and, you know, have all the diatonic chords or six of the seven diatonic chords yeah. in C major available to you to just mess around with, you know? Yeah, because, for example, uh, depending on how much theory you know, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the C major scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and if you take triads based on those, those uh, notes from the scale, then you end up with the, sort of the, the chord language for the key of C. And the chords go C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor, and then the dreaded B diminished <laughs> chord. But we, we'll, we won't deal with the diminished chord right now. But the nice thing is, okay, they're either major or minor. And <clears throat> so this is a, you automatically get a C chord on the open strings. And because it's, an, because it's a, a major chord, 
you automatically get a major chord if you do a bar chord anywhere on the guitar. So if you're looking for F, you know, C, G, E, F, there it is. There's the bass note, and then you just bar across. There's your F major chord, right? Similarly, your G major chord is two frets higher than that. So there's one, four, and five right away. Almost a no-brainer, right? Yeah. You can play a whole lot of songs with just those three chords. But then, the, then you run into the whole issue, well, how do you play a minor chord then? I mean, sure, the major chords are easy enough to play. But this, the, the major third is on, is on the high string here, is on the, the first string. So in order to play a minor version of the same kind of chord, you'd have to be able to lower that, that note one fret on that, on that string. And um, it, you run into like, well, I don't really have enough fingers, you know, to <laughs> play all the strings. So what we do is we do this thing that is very common with um, altered tunings, with open chord tunings is that we allow certain strings, especially strings that ring the first note of the scale and the fifth note of the scale, we let them ring uh, in all the chord voicings. And that sort of becomes part of the charm mm -hmm. of the open tuning. So there's the C. So for the D minor, what I do, this would be a D major, but here's the third, so I have to lower it. So all I do is I play the bottom two strings just to give that sort of power chord on the bottom, right? And there's the third. Now, now it's, that's the D minor triad. And then I let the middle strings just ring open. And we end up with what's really called a, a D minor 11th chord. Okay. And then you can use this as your template for every minor chord that you need. So there's the two chord. Raise it two frets, you get the three chord, which in this case is E minor. And then the sixth chord would be up here at the ninth fret, that's an A minor, the key of C. So right there you have one, two, Three, four, five, six, and back down. Six, five, four, three, two, one. So that is actually even easier than standard tuning. <laughs> I love that because, guys, if you're if you've heard about you know alter tunings and you think maybe oh, I just can't get into it, it's too difficult for me. All the notes are changing on the fretboard. How am I supposed to keep up with that? This is a great example of how you can start experimenting with this to kind of push yourself and kind of force yourself to get creative and just have fun in a new way For sure. on the guitar, right? Yeah, it gives you a, a whole new set of set of tools to write in a, a different sound than standard tuning. Right, and I, I've, I've probably only written two tunes in alter tunings, but every time I intentionally put my guitar there and left it there for a while, something came out, something really cool. Nice. So Yeah, that's cool. awesome. Um, what I would like to ask you to do is put your uh, guitar back in your C alter tuning mm -hmm. and maybe just show us... Um, that maybe just the first part of the A section, like break that down a little bit and then play the entire thing for us, just to kind of show sure. you, like this would be the musical enlightenment or how you can apply this to music or you know the things that you might come up with if you mess with alternate tunings in a way that you're aiming to be creative or you know get those things out of your head that you might not be able to do with standard tuning. Cool. But this is a really nice song, I really liked it. Thank you. Yeah, so this is, the tune I wrote a long time ago called The First Ride. And the, f the first section, um, basically, it sort of create, uh, consists of like an introductory sort of thing. Uh, it's just, it's, um, it's like a bass line and a rhythm, but it's, there's no melody yet for the first few bars. It just sort of gets you going. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's meant to evoke the sound like, like a horse, you know, sort of running along. That's what I was thinking about. I was thinking about this, this childhood, terror, terrifying childhood memory of going <laughs> horseback riding for the first time. Anyway, so, and then it gets into this, this melodic section, um, and it really uses the tuning very effectively, I think. So here's the kind of the intro. And here's where the melody starts. about it is that nothing I'm doing with my left hand is particularly challenging right. in that whole section of the tune. A lot of open strings, um, a lot of using the, the, the bass notes that are close to each other in a way that you, know, you don't have to finger every single note. Um, 
and then there's there's some familiar uh, material from standard tuning because these two strings haven't changed from standard tuning, the mm -hmm. G and the E. So you can, if you're used to playing parallel sixth harmony, like a lot of guitarists rely on, mm -hmm. um, that that part of the tuning is still there. So you can still get a lot of that kind of language in there that you're familiar with from standard tuning and apply it to this thing where, where you've got open strings ringing that are very C major. Mm. It's cool, it's a nice crossover kind of tuning. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I wanna hear the whole thing again. All right, so the whole song. Guys, you're gonna love this. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first ride. That's super mm -hmm. inspiring, man. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for playing. Much. That. Pleasure. Guys, that brings us to the section of the show, the weekly challenge. And you need to take that inspiration and go take some action <laughs> on it, man. I, if you're a newer player, beginner, kind of reaching intermediate, I would challenge you 
to throw your guitar in that C open tuning and just experiment with those diatonic chords moving around like Don showed you. And mm -hmm. if you're more of a kind of upper intermediate advanced player, you know, experiment with several tunings. It could be one of the ones Don goes over in this lesson. It could be one you find online, anywhere, it doesn't matter. And just see what you come up with and see, you know, if you can get what's in your head out a little bit more. So that's my challenge for this week. And hopefully you'll get a lot of good um, kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Returns. Pers perspiration. Pers well, you're going to get that regardless. <laughs> I always do, man. When I, when I have that kind of creative buzzing going on in my head, I sweat a lot. <laughs> cool. So that's my weekly challenge for you now. On to one of my favorite parts of the show, Tone Recipe. <laughs> Chef Don. <laughs> now this is just where we're going to go through and find out what Don's playing all the way from his strings, his fingernails, and pedals he has <clears throat> going. And I like to call this one Don's Dark Chocolate Maple Bacon Cupcakes. Here's Oof. a picture for you. That sounds dangerous. Well, this guitar, you, I wish all of you could be here to hear this guitar in person. It sounds extremely great in person so yeah like from top to bottom man tell us anything you want about the stuff you sure use to give, so. well this particular guitar um is one that was made for me by a builder that i've been working with for the, about the last 20 years his name is mark beneteau mm -hmm. and he's based in saint thomas ontario which is uh, just south of london ontario sort of halfway between detroit and toronto and um he has been plying his craft since the 70s He's an amazing guy, a really cool guy, an amazing builder. And I knew about his guitars years before I started working with him. I, I would pick one up every once in a while at an acoustic guitar store and they'd kind of blow my mind. Oof. And um, then uh, we talked together uh, about 20 years ago about working on an instrument. And the first thing he made for me was a baritone. Since then, he's made me two or three baritones, including one with fan frets. He's made me several regular pitch guitars, and his most recent one, uh, well, the second most recent creation he made for me was his first harp guitar. So uh, that's a monstrosity. Wow. <laughs> but uh, uh, he most recently made me a, a spruce and a coco bolo guitar with fan frets. This one, though, is from a few years ago. And uh, I take it on the road still, because it's, uh, it, it, as opposed to the brand new one, because um, it's got this warmth and playability uh, from being a few years old. And this guitar actually was very badly damaged uh, by the airlines a couple of years ago. And Mark, but fortunately the airlines paid for Mark to rebuild the guitar and it, gave, <laughs> it was even better, <laughs> amazingly enough. So this is an, a remarkable guitar. Uh, it's cedar top and um, this is called sapele or sapele or whatever, mm -hmm. the back and sides. It's like a relative of mahogany. Um, it's got the uh, Laskin arm bevel and it's got the, uh, the cup holder, I mean the, uh, the, uh, the sound for it on the side. Because I tune so often below pitch, um, it, the, the sort of the physics of it is that when you have a lot of low sounds coming out of the chamber, it's better if they have more than one spot to actually pop out. It's like a ported speaker cap then. That's kind of, kind of oh, the idea. Okay. And so then uh, the sort of added side benefit is that you have like a little acoustic monitor there, you can hear yourself a little bit better. And um, yeah, so that's cool. And then Mark has made me basically the same body shape and scale length for pretty much all the guitars he's made for me. So it's uh, like an SJ uh, body size. And the um, scale length is a little longer than normal. Um, he usually goes with about 26 inches, I guess, on a regular guitar for me. And on the baritone, the fan fret is 26 on the short side and 28 on the long side. So it's pretty radical fan on that one. Um, yeah, and then of course you can't really see his logo. There's one of, there his, one of his two logos he uses. That's just that's his name spelt out. The other one is just a stylized B. So unfortunately a lot of people think, oh, you play a uh, breed love. And I said, no, 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 nope. it's, it's a Beneteau, <laughs> it's a Beneteau. Um, and he uses Goto 510 tuners. And um, yeah, so that's this lovely instrument. I am quite in love with this guitar. Um, since uh, he first built it for me. And then in terms of gear, uh, yeah. um, I've, I've brought very little gear here today, but uh, what, this, what I have in the guitar is uh, the K&K &K Quantum Trinity system uh, for sound reinforcement. So you can't see the, the pickup, but it's actually three piezo pieces on the bridge plate. So depending on how much you know about guitar construction, uh, under the X brace, sort of in the lower bout below the sound hole, um, the sound gets transferred to the top by means of a piece of hardwood. It's usually a piece of rosewood. And that piece of rosewood is what the 
the three pieces of piezo are stuck to, under there, sort of epoxied on. And then that in combination with a, a condenser mic, which you may or may not be able to see there in the sound hole, um, makes for a very, very natural sound. Uh, you know, saddle mounted pickups tend to be very quacky sounding. Even just the, the transducer on this guitar sounds much more acoustic than most uh, other transducers do. And then the, the mic gives you the moving air, you know, the, the realism, you know, and the, the sheen on the top end that the pickups tend not to be able to get on their own. So then I come out with a, a TRS cable, a stereo cable, and then that goes to a, a, a little sort of boutique preamp that they make called a, a quantum blender, that's what it's called. And I think one of our cameras is heading down there now. Yep. So you can see it's a little beaten up from the road. That you can see I've scrawled on it, it says new. <laughs> this is the newest one I have. It's not even all that old, it's just gotten beaten up on the road. But the cool thing is you go in the back of it with your stereo cable, and then what it does is it actually splits the signal into two, back into two uh, sources again. And so um, as I'm looking at it, or as maybe on the camera, it's uh, the, uh, the other way around, from the camera's point of view, on the right side would be the, the microphone side, and the left side would be the, the, the transducer side. And then on the front of the, of the uh, unit, there's uh, adjustments for gain and volume, and then the three band EQ. And depending on how you set them, of course, you can um, basically preamp and uh, equalize your sound. You can come out of it either separately and then go to effects that way, or you can just come out as a mono mixed signal, mm -hmm. which is how I use it most of the time. And then today we're using it as a DI as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, on stage, I have three guitars. So I have three of these pickups set up, uh, three of these preamps set up. And I have a mixer on stage so I can pop among the guitars. Oh, cool. And then I come out of that to a pedal board, which I didn't bring today, but my pedal board's pretty simple. It's just got 24-7 um, uh, reverb on it, uh, just a slight bit. And then it's got um, chorus I can kick in and out. Uh, delay I can kick in and out, octave I can kick in and out. I sweep it so that it only affects the bottom couple of strings and gives you that extra, you know, pretend bass player yeah. on stage. I, and I don't use it full time. And then on my baritone I have one song that I played through uh, the, an envelope filter, a, a Qtron envelope filter, which is great, automatic wah-wah. It's a very funky tune, great for the bass line. I think I was listening to that yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's on my new album, <laughs> yeah. there's a version of it. Yep. Um, and that's basically it, that's my gear. Yeah, cool. What hilarious. about uh, your strings? Oh yeah, the strings are um, Ernie Ball aluminum bronze strings. And uh, um, it's kind of funny, I was explaining to one of the fellows here earlier on that um, for years I used a different brand of strings and uh, then Ernie Ball started saying, hey, you should try these ones, you should try these ones. And I, you know, get a lot of offers to try things out and I, they sent me some to try. And they were quite different. Like, I mean, that's good. I mean, I guess, you know, if you really want to make a distinctive sounding string. They didn't sound like anything else I'd tried. But at first it was a little jarring, <laughs> you know, because uh, I was used to phosphor bronze strings that have lots and lots of harmonic content, lots of jangle to them. And then these could, these strings have much less jangle and they're much stronger fundamental, which um, people kept saying, well, there's a certain clarity to them. And I realized, okay, that's what they're talking about. So uh, I've tried them out for about six months. I just left one guitar sort of strung up with them kept changing them, thinking, yeah, I don't know, maybe I could be convinced. And then eventually I thought, no, they actually sound great. And um, so it took me a little warming up, but they're, they're great. So those are alum uh, aluminum bronze by Ernie Ball. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I know people are going to ask this question, so sure. I'll go ahead and ask you. What about your nails? Ah, yes, the nails. Yeah. Well, these particular ones are a little shoddy, but um, and they're a little weird looking because they're white. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for just to, to backtrack, many years ago, I started going to a nail salon and getting my nails done professionally. I, I used to use picks, you know, metal picks, but then the clickety clackety, you know, it sounds like you're a train going down the track, uh, drove me crazy, especially when I heard it recorded. I thought, yeah. I, can't, I can't do that. So I started using the uh, artificial salon nails. Worked great. The problem is I found myself on the road sometimes with a broken nail, having to find a nail salon somewhere to get, get it fixed. And then eventually I started carrying around a, an emergency kit and all it is, it's a set of nails from uh, the pharmacy. And like in the States, you can get them at Rite Aid. And uh, here in Canada, you can get them at Shoppers Drug Mart or Pharmapri or whatever. And they're just, they're made by a company called Nailene, I think. And they're just, uh, you can get like a couple of hundred in a kit. It comes with oh, wow. glue and uh, file. 
and that d on their own they're too thin. So what I do is I, I put one and then I glue another one on top of it. So it comes with like a super glue uh -huh. kind of thing. And um, then that works great. They're nice and tough and uh, the, the tone is great. They're just as good as salon nails. Um, and then when I visit Germany, um, there's a, a company there uh, called Kiss that makes, that makes a really, really natural looking extra tough nail that's perfect for guitar playing. So uh, I think, they're, <laughs> believe it or not, they're called nude. That's what they're called. Um, <laughs> Got to stock up on the nude. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they work great. So my wife plays as well. So she was just touring Germany, and she brought back a couple of boxes. But I didn't bring any with me. But anyway, I'm, I'm still in the Shoppers Drug Mart ones. Oh, that's great, man. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm all natural. Oh, But I don't you. play as much finger cell as you. So. Oh, well, you know, when, you, when you're playing all this... Uh, yeah. Steel string guitar stuff and very aggressively. Yeah, as it I is do. super aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, there's kind of no, no, no other solution, really. No kidding. It's time for the third degree. Oh. And that's where you get put in the hot seat. Not really. I'm going to ask you three kind of random off the wall questions. And you can just answer them any way you want. Okay. Joking, serious, whatever. Let's see what happens. Okay. What was no your idea. first guitar? My first guitar huh? was a Stella that was probably made in about 1346. Uh, <laughs> no, it was, it was a really old guitar. My, my sister was at a boarding school. My sister's 10 years older than me. Oh, okay. And she was off at boarding school, and I guess the nuns got um, uh, left a bunch of money in a will, specifically for buying new instruments for the school orchestra. Oh, wow. And my sister played guitar and clarinet in the school orchestra. So they got a bunch of replacement instruments, and the kids got to take their old crummy instruments home. For, for good. So we got this crazy old Stella with action about this high off the neck. And my older brother and I just took to it like flies to you know what. Mm -hmm. And um, so my, my older brother was really my, my first guitar teacher. Oh, that's he, neat. He's man. six years older than me and he would learn stuff from his friends and come over and said, I was his guinea pig, you know, mm -hmm. try bending a note, try playing vibrato. <laughs> it was great. So, yeah. It's like my fingers are bleeding. Keep doing it. It's <laughs> Keep fine. doing it. You, you'll be all right. <laughs> Okay, next question, what do I want to ask? Um, if you could only re recommend one book and or album for our audience to check out, what would they be? Uh, a, a book on any A book subject? on music. A book on music. Book, something um, like that, yeah. Or it can be two albums. Like sure, okay, well, a, a music book that I found really fascinating to read um, is by John Cage, a uh, great um, 20th century. I think. don't think he lived into the 21st uh, century. Yeah, I never thought about it. Yeah. yeah. John Cage was a, an amazing composer, very uh, musical philosopher, visionary kind of guy, very avant-garde. Uh, mm -hmm. Did th he basically his whole idea was that all sound can be music, and of course that's really how we live now. I mean, especially with computers, you know, you can make music out of any sound really, and um, so as long as you can take sound and, and humanly organize it, that's that's music. Um, and he wrote a book called Silence, which is a collection of essays that he wrote about music. Really fascinating. I got to meet John Cage. Really? Uh, yeah, when I was in university, uh, my composition professor brought him to our class. And I was sitting this far away from John Cage, wow. kibitzing with him, making him laugh. I thought, this, this, this kind of rocks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, oh, the album. Yeah, sure. Um, probably the, the, the Curtain Concert by Keith Jarrett. Okay. It's uh, not a guitar album. It's a solo piano, completely improv improvised album that uh, Keith Jarrett, um, it's a performance he did in Cologne in early 1975. And a friend of mine lent it to me many years ago and it blew my mind. And I love the album so much that uh, I've per repurchased it several times, including I finally bought an HD tracks version of it on the internet, you know, in 2496. And Listening to that on my studio system is just glorious, wow. and uh, and I was listening to it in the car this morning. Um, it's it's just one of these albums that, for me, it's like desert album, de desert, desert island, island plus, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a it's so sweet because he there's no score. He never played those tunes again, but fortunately they got recorded, and it's a magnificent album. That's wild, man. Yeah, yeah. I have to check that out. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question. This is a. Don't take those too seriously. Who are three of your biggest musical influences? Doesn't have to be guitar. Doesn't have to be your top three. Just three. Well, probably I'd say Keith Jarrett's one of them. Okay. Uh, another one would be Steve Reich. I always mention him. He's a great composer. Um, uh, uses what he calls canonic form a lot of the time, like phasing sounds and stuff like that. Hmm. I studied him in school. Again, he's another guy that my prof brought to school. 
Um, he's still around. He's in his 80s now. He and he's still really active, really vibrant. Still plays in his ensemble, and still writing new music. And he's amazing. So um, again, surprisingly, not a guitar player, but. For, for me, it's not surprising because I listen to music. Mm -hmm. The guitar is a musical instrument, one of the many I listen to. And then uh, third biggest musical influence, maybe in more in a spiritual sense than an overt musical sense, maybe Pat Metheny. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, again, a guitar player for once. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't play anything that sounds like a Pat Metheny tune, except one piece that's a little bit influenced by him. But... Um, for me, I think what I love about what he does is he doesn't sit still, you know. From album to album, he can have a completely different sound. He can try a totally different project. Um, his last many records, almost every single album is with a different band, uh, the Unity Band, and the, you know, then these trios and duets that he puts together in solo albums, solo guitar albums. Um, and then the Orchestrion project, where he was playing with all these automatic instruments. Oh, crazy, yeah. you know. So the guy's really very inspiring. Awesome. That's yeah. a, those are all very good answers. That Thank I'm you. Glad I asked them yeah. to you. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks for coming out today, man. Yeah, Don is going to play one more song for us at the end of everything, but I just want to kind of reiterate where you can find all your stuff. Your latest project just came out this year, right? Yeah. And I have to say this very slowly, otherwise I mess it up. A million Brazilian. Civilians. Very well done. And it's a great album. I've listened to it for like the past two weeks. Great uh, Thank you. instrumental guitar writing stuff, great songwriting stuff. You're a singer too. Thank you, yeah. 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 So I do all that awesome. stuff. And you can find that at facebook.com slash Don Ross Music or just Don Ross Online.com. Thanks guys for watching this episode of the Fretboard Chronicles. I'll give you an opportunity to get tuned back there. Um, if you would like to advance your guitar playing in a really positive way, check out Guitario.com. The community there is awesome. It's very supportive. You're going to find a lot of things. Actually, the series or the course that John just filmed today is going to be there in a few weeks as soon as we have it up and edited. So make sure to check that out. And remember, with clear goals and consistent practice, you will reach your goals on the guitar. Amen to that. Cool. All right, I'll play the uh, title track off my most recent album. Yes, this is the one so I, I know to you hear. like it. Yeah, <laughs> and I, it's funny the way this one came about. I uh, I got contacted by the manager for Swedish House Mafia, uh, electronic dance music band, and I, I knew about them mostly because of I tour Europe a lot and I was hearing their music on the car radio all the time, <laughs> and. And she said, yeah, the guys are huge fans of what you do, especially harmonically, like the chord changes you use and stuff. And, well, thank you. And so she said, yeah, the guys want to, I want you to demo some stuff for them. Two of them are putting out a duet album. And who knows, maybe uh, they'll collaborate with you. Yeah. So I did demo a few things, none of which ended up on the record, but it was still a pleasure to be asked. And, uh, and this is one of the tunes I demoed for them. So this is called A Million Brazilian Civilians. Mm -hmm. 